should not, critical race theory should not have anything to do with science. And I'm going to keep saying it until I'm blue in the face. This particular video has been a long time in coming, um, but it's prompted in the fact that um, there seems to be a large number of universities, strike that, there is a large number of universities and um, professional scientific societies that are embracing the notions of critical theory and critical race theory and pushing them as part of the professional, develop, uh, professional society of science. And that's really, really, really concerning because in my view, um, in my view, it actually goes very much against the fundamental norms of science, which are grounded in enlightenment thinking. And as you can read elsewhere, postmodern thought um, is often either indifferent to openly hostile, depending upon the circumstances, to science, to the scientific method, to the scientific disciplines and scientific enterprise. If you want a recent public example of that, the shutdown STEM campaign, um, which started last year and is happening again this year, I believe, openly called everyone in STEM and in academia in general racist um, at one point, um, implicitly or explicitly on the website for the campaign. That may have changed since I saw it last year, fairly enough, but... Um, yeah, there's an implicit or an explicit assumption there that was, anyway, that um, everybody in STEM and academia is racist, and that is drawn from postmodern thought, critical theory, critical race theory. Um, so I'm going to go through in this video as much as I can um, here and as briefly as I can um, how critical race theory in particular is completely at odds um, and anti-science. Um, here in its foundational materials. I'm going to try and use their work as much as I can on the critical race theory side um, to show with some help from materials. Thank you for materials from New Discourses um, and a few other places to point this out. And I will also be drawing from this book, uh, Cynical Theories, here, which lays out a bunch of this nicely and connecting it to science. But I want to start first with something that's important because I think a lot of scientists have forgotten what the norms of science are, um, what the norms of scientific, the scientific enterprise are in academic scientific research and, and what, what, what the norms are with respect to scientific research and academic institutions, what they should be, what they are. And I don't blame them necessarily for forgetting. Um, and because when I was thinking about it and looking at all this and like, why am I so aggravated with the way this conversation is going and the amount of critical race theory garbage that's in science. Um, the reason for that is actually pretty simple because, you know, it, it, it is so against a lot of the enlightenment logic in that's involved in science and the norms of the scientific enterprise that, um, it's, it's really unfortunate. And, the thing about it is, is I didn't even learn what these norms were. You kind of, you, you were taught them a little bit if you were, if you were in the right place and you were doing a lot of research or you were doing this and that. You learned a lot of them just through the practice kind of thing. So I could name all these things and why they are. But, um, well, in my own words, I could name them and why they are. But I didn't teach that they, I didn't learn that they all had formal names when I was taking science as an undergrad in college. Did not learn them. Was not taught them. Did not learn them in master's. Did not learn them in PhD, at least not the formal teaching of them. Um, I didn't learn them actually until the last couple of years when I went to go searching for them myself because I was curious, hey, where do we draw these things from? And I think my experience is very true of a lot of scientists of my generation that they are not taught these norms anymore and why they're important and why what they're learning now with critical theory and postmodern thought is a bad idea and completely counter to these norms and how they could end up causing lots of problems. So we're going to walk through what these norms are. And this actually, this paper um, that's hosted publicly actually has a really great description of the norms and where they came from. Um, Robert Merton in 1942 was the literal um, guy to start actually putting pen to paper in and giving giving this these things meaning and showing us and giving words to the structure that we have in science. 
um, sought to give shape, literally structure, to the normative sister of system of science overall by specifying norms that fairly and uniquely characterize the system. His pithy formulation of four norms was never intended as an exhaustive specification of the entire normative system of science. This is true. Other norms have been um, added since then. Um, and other people have proposed it. In fact, there's a few in this article that were proposed in addition. Um, but these four are generally agreed upon even today as being uh, norms of science. So that's why I'm going with this. Um, so 1942, heck, we are <laughs> uh, approaching 80 years old with these actually being formally named um, as part of science. So let's go here to the Mertonian norms themselves. The first Mertonian norm is communality. Um, also, it's also called communalism, not communism. Um, it, I mean, it, communism in the original, um, <laughs> but I'm not going to use communism because uh, that refers to a uh, specific organizational government that I do not like. Communism sucks. Um, communalism or communality, which is the common ownership of scientific results and methods and the consequent imperative to share both freely. The principle is based upon the fact that scientific findings are always a product of collaborative efforts and, quote, constitute a common heritage in which the equity of the individual producer is severely limited. And by equity, he does not mean equality of outcome. Here he means the equality of opportunity. Um, or, yeah, the equality of opportunity. Or Merton identified secrecy as the antithesis of communality. Yes. So this idea of communality or communism, communism, communal, I'm just going to say communality. Um, <laughs> the idea of communality is where we draw the practice of publishing, of publishing articles, uh, reports, everything like that. Communality is one of the reasons scientists are okay with the idea of, in the U.S., for example, um, anything that was funded by a federal grant has to be, its data has to be made publicly available somewhere. Um, where exactly sometimes is a mystery, <laughs> but it has to be made publicly available somewhere. So like everything that I do that's off a taxpayer grant has to be made publicly available somewhere. Um, that is not true of all countries, just because, um, for example, um, in Africa, a lot of the weather station data in Africa is actually considered matters of national security, so it's really hard to get a hold of it to begin with. Um, so there's things like that that you have to juggle, but as a rule in science, this is kind of why we're all for, generally speaking, we try to do open access, try to publish, get it written up somewhere. It has to be reproducible. All those kinds of things are where uh, communality is the idea of where that comes from, that it should be transparent, that knowledge should be accessible to everybody. It belongs to everybody. That doesn't mean you don't get credit for discovering something. That's very different. There's still a practice of making sure that whomever uh, makes a brand new discovery, um, they get the credit for that. But the knowledge from that discovery belongs to everybody, is the idea there. Um, that knowledge comes to everybody. It should be able to be easily, un it should be understood and accessible to everybody, even if it takes you, you got to learn the basics of some science here or there to get to it, um, to get to understand it. It belongs to everybody. And that's not just scientists necessarily that we're talking about here. It does quite literally mean public at large too. You should be able to get this information is what, uh, get this information and knowledge as you see fit, um, here. So that's the first one. That is an important one. Probably the most important one for what we're going to talk about is actually the second one, the principle of universalism, that scientific work and findings should be evaluated on the basis of, quote, pre-established impersonal criteria, consonants with observation and with previously confirmed knowledge, emphasis in the original, and not the personal or social attributes of the scientists involved, such objectivity objectivity ensures that the merits of f scientific findings as well as the excellence of scientists accomplishments be evaluated without references without reference to the scientists nationality race religion personal affiliations and other relevant characteristics another way to put this um is to say anybody can do science anybody can be a scientist um and yeah see Professional affiliations is one thing that's included here are other irre irrelevant characteristics. In climate science is a good example. A lot of the achievements and discoveries that moved climate science along in the early years, and particularly in the early 1900s and mid-1900s um, here and starting in 1850, these were not done 
by climatologists. A lot of them were done by people who were engineers or geologists or any kind of things who were not experts in climate science. The same thing can go for just the average Joe doing good science. That's why professional affiliation is the thing. So this is, again, the idea is that anybody here can do science. And anybody's work should not be evaluated on their race, on their religion, on sex, on gender, on any of that. None of that matters in the idea of universalism. It's did you, you know, what is your, I mean, did you, did you follow a set method? Did your, did your argument make sense? Did your, does your work, your observations from your study match to something in the past or is it completely different? That doesn't discount a study. I mean, if your observation is, ends up, if your observations and your results end up being different from prior studies, that's going to be a bone of contention because of course now you're butting up and creating conflict and they got to sort it out. And that's another thing. We'll get to that in a second. But, um, you know, it's got to line up with what we already know. It's got to line up with observations that are out there, particularly if you're doing physical science stuff, you want to be able to match it to observations as much as you can. Um, impersonal criteria with methods and what have you. I mean, one of the things I look for in peer review is whether or not the study was constructed in, a, in such a manner that they are getting an answer that they want rather than an answer that should just come from general knowledge. So a bias study is kind of what I look after there. Um, did you construct it fairly um, kind of thing? Um, so there's impersonal criteria here, but the biggest thing for what we're talking about is that whatever, whatever scientific work you are doing, it should be judged only on its merits not on its merits and the construction of the logic of the argument and things like that, but not ever, never, 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 ever, ever, ever on the race, the sex, the gender, orientation, religion, professional affiliation. None of that matters. None of that is supposed to matter when it comes to science. That's the principle of universalism here. And it draws from the idea of the enlightenment thinking where you, you know, you judge based on the merits of the argument. You do not judge on a personal characteristics. You don't judge on somebody's personality either. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to judge on, on the irrelevant moral stuff that's going on in somebody in somebody's life that you don't like um, kind of thing. Like I said with the other video on the peril of politicizing science. Michael Mann, in my estimation, looking at his stuff, he's a jerk uh, from what I've seen of him online and the fact that he likes to sue people left and right. Um, or at least it seems like it. Sorry, gotta say it. It seems like it to me. Um, he's still brilliant in what he's done. He's put a lot of brilliant work together and I, I, I applaud and I acknowledge that. Um, he's done some brilliant stuff and it's come under some heavy critique too. Don't get me wrong, but that's the biggest thing. Do we meet this? Do we meet any of these norms perfectly? No, I'm going to say that before I forget. We do not meet any of these norms perfectly all the time. We're human still, you know, there's going to be those things. We're human. We're products of our own time. We will err. Um, and what have you. And again, science does not give you wisdom necessarily. The third one, also relevant to this discussion. Um, in fact, all of them are relevant and just in varying degrees. The principle of disinterestedness demands that the scientist's work remain uncorrupted by self-interested motivations. It precludes the pursuit of science for the sake of rich riches, though Merton recognized the powerful influence of competition for scientific priority. He carefully distinguished between personal altruism and the institutional mandate in favor of disinterestedness. Okay. Basically, one way this has been referred to, this idea of disinterestedness, is you should be pursuing science for science's sake. I have another way of looking at it in that I've said, it said in the other video the other day, the purpose of science is the pursuit of the truth. And that is what a scientist should always be interested in. Regardless of whatever other interests you may have, that is the top priority. In the two in the two videos about the purpose of science and the purpose of the scientist, I talked about this and what my thoughts are. And that the purpose of the science should be the pursuit of the truth, not any ideology that you may find important outside of your work as a scientist. And where this a good example of where this has been screwed up historically is Trofim Lysenko. Trofim Lysenko loved Marxism. And so he threw out 100 years of Mendelian genetics, got in good with Stalin. Any scientists who disagreed and were trying to pursue the truth were executed or punished or made to say otherwise of what they originally believed. Um, and the result was millions of people died in a famine in the USSR because Lysenko was wrong, but he was more uh, interested in his ideology. He was not interested in the pursuit of the truth. So that's a key one here is 
this the disinterested thing is where we've come from in many years and probably a lot of a lot of people may say just from the general public looking in to into the scientific world now this is the principle of disinterestedness is the one where we get the idea of scientists should not be involved in political advocacy um should not be doing it um because this really does have a potential corrupting influence we recognize that that's definitely not always possible um, but if they're motivating it, it should be about, if they're doing that, it should be about the altruism. It should be about the pursuit of the truth and wanting to make sure policymakers, anything like that are working for the truth, not advocating for a specific policy. Now this gets into the interesting murky water that we're in now, because of course I'm a scientist, but I'm also still a citizen of the United States. And of course I have a vested interest in what's going on policy wise also. And that also includes with respect to things going on in my field. So if you go digging in this, in the literature, there's a lot of disagreements, um, uh, in the literature discussion with editorials and journals in particular about how much scientists should be advocates, um, should get involved in advocacy. That's a work for another day, but generally the purpose of science, particularly when you're doing research, should always be the pursuit of the truth. It should not be that. And that's where disinterestedness comes in. You don't care about how it's, well, you probably do care, but when you're, particularly when you're doing the research, what matters is what's the answer to your question? What is the truth with regards to your question and the thing you're studying? The final one is organized skepticism, which refers to the detached, to quote, the, uh, to the quote, yeah. Detached scrutiny of beliefs in terms of empirical and logical criteria. This principle has implications for both producers and consumers of scientific findings. The former need to present their findings methods and methods transparently so that their value can be assessed. And the latter need to suspend judgment until they have examined the findings and methods according to accepted standards and criteria. One of the big things about this is that you are not going after the person who disagrees with you. This has a lot to do with disagreement in sciences, the organized skepticism kind of thing. You are not going after the disagree you are not going after the person for necessarily having for, for you're not going after the person themselves. You are going after the arguments. You're going after the things that they think based upon the evidence and data and everything like that. And quite often you are critiquing the evidence and data to say, well, maybe it doesn't say what you think it says. And did you look at this thing over here? You're looking at the arguments. You're looking at that. You are never assuming something necessarily about the morals. That doesn't necessarily stop you from doing so. But with the idea of the organized skepticism, the focus should be on the idea of the logic behind the argument, uh, the data, the evidence, the methods of the study. All of that is fair game, open for critique. Um, and a good example of the, of this, I think, in the peril politicizing science, the Anna um, Krylov, Professor Krylov, talked a little bit about one example where um, this guy was really, really highly cited, did great work in his field, and then he went and commented on something and did some bunk analysis in another field. The organized skepticism principle, she talked about it there. What resulted from that is people recognized his earlier work was great. It has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of citations that have built up since then. The other article that has bug stuff in it where he was commenting on all sorts of things and went off and made crazy arguments and what have you, and crazy and racist arguments, actually, is what she said. I think racist or sexist, something like that um, that he said there. I'd have to go back and read the letter again. I can't remember. Um, you can watch the other video. I mentioned it, too, in the other video, The Peril of Politicizing Science. Anyway, um, that... That particular article that the same author wrote who had hundreds of citations on this earlier paper, he wrote a second paper, the second paper he wrote that was so full of junk and garbage and bad methods and bad arguments and what have you. It has less than 100 citations to this day, and it's a pretty old article now um, because I think it was the 60s. So, yeah, it, it's <laughs> it's really old. It was really bad and crummily done, and nobody cited it because everybody saw how bad it was. That's what we, that's one of the things we mean by organized skepticism there is that you seeing how bad a person's argument is, it's not cited. It's not referred to. It's often can be, you know, can be going back and forth. And one of the things you'll see in journals, I think I've talked about this in another um, place actually on SciWorthy, but um, 
Yeah. Um, one of the things you'll see often in journals is if there's an article published and there's a disagreement, somebody who has a disagreement will write um, a uh, write a comment on the article that gets published in the journal, and then the, the guy who wrote the original article can comment back, and you'll see them go back and forth. But it's all in the published record in line with the idea of communality um, here that, you know, you got to be transparent with everything. So transparency is also in the organized skepticism thing, because how can you critique anything if you're not um, providing all the information? And there, so there's a lot of intertwining between these principles, as you might tell, um, or these norms. But organized skepticism, general thing I would say about that is you are scrutiny, scrutinizing the arguments in there based upon the empirical and logical evidence and logic of the argument. You are not scrutinizing it based upon what you think of the moral character of the person, although sometimes that does get involved because, again, scientists are human. So those are the basic norms. Um, there's more, but these are the four that are the most well-known and the most um, agreed upon amongst the scientific community and the sociologists um, who've also studied the, the scientific community and how we, how we work. So that, the next thing that comes up then is, okay, you have counter norms of each, to each of these. Um, Merton said it himself, communality, the opposite is secrecy. Um, you're not sharing things. You're not sharing things with people. I'm holding it back. Um, the other thing here, uh, universalism opposite is kind of, they, they kind of refer to the opposite, the counter norm of this is particularism, um, in here. Of course, this is interestedness. That's kind of an odd, odd thing. And this is more of a dogmatism is what they kind of refer to as a counter norm for the organized skepticism. And that's the idea, again, the idea that you are critiquing, um, people, and specific things um, here. You want to have, again, detached scrutiny here comes, you don't invest yourself into it personally when you're when you're doing that. So speaking of which, um, so critical race theory. Okay, this is the theory in the 1970s that posits that racism is everywhere um, and endemic to American society. Simplest way I, I can put it, um, I'm sure others may add more to it, but there's a lot of things in critical race theory that I think actually are quite the opposite of the norms of science. And that's the reason why I'm going to say it here. Critical race theory has no place in science. It is anti-science altogether, and it should never, ever be put into science, which I'm afraid it is, unfortunately. So congratulations. I hope you enjoy scientists who can't do science anymore. <clears throat> One of the things that critical race theory uses that I think makes it actually um, sort of going in the opposite vein from communality and more towards secrecy is the idea of standpoint epistemology um, is one of the things here. And um, standpoint epistemology is the idea here and coming from new discourses. So I'll try and summarize some of this, but um, I encourage you to go read it in their uh, woke encyclopedia, if you will, the social justice encyclopedia. Anyway, standpoint epistemology comes from the idea that people who are oppressed in society, people who are oppressed and marginalized or historically oppressed and marginalized, they're the only ones who have knowledge of how oppressed they are, how oppressed their group is. Um, somebody who is not oppressed or who is in the oppressor class um, can't know, doesn't know, they're privileged, they can't see it, um, there's no way they can know it. Um, here, so let's see. Um, in short, standpoint theory posits that one's social position relative to systemic power confers additional insight and or knowledges that allows the oppressed to understand both oppression and the society's systems or systems it operates within better than the privileged are able to see. So this is knowledge that is specialized, secret, only belongs to one person. This is something that is uh, central to critical race theory. And in the New Discourses commentary, um, they go down here further. Yes, as Harding noted below, it is not sufficient for one to merely possess the identity group membership to gain special insight offered by standpoint epistemology, which is how do you know things. One must also be politically engaged, which means having adopted the right critical methods and critical consciousness or wokeness. In other words, insight to societal truths is available by virtue of standpoint theory to members of minoritized groups who are also critical theorists, but essentially nobody else. Everyone else is trapped in the master's world and somehow subscribing to the master's view. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there are those, uh, that said, there are also believed, uh, usually within social justice perspectives, to be specialized knowledges based in the lived experience of belonging to some identity group. 
These aren't strictly understood under the umbrella unless they invoke positionality or power dynamics as the reason for specialized insight, and they represent a different form of identity-based knowledges. They claim a kind of knowledge is not something to be skeptical of, as everyday experiences of certain phenomena tend to be different for people with different physiological features. And it is, okay. <clears throat> In practice, though it is possible, it is very difficult for this other kind of identity knowledge is claimed to refrain from be drawing upon standpoint epistemology when utilized by a member of a minoritized group, especially in service of critical social justice, because the lived experience of being such a person will almost definitely bring up what it's like to be such a person in society that is allegedly rife with such power dynamics. Okay. In summary, standpoint epistemology and related based it are complicated and widely discredited way to create and just a kind of nog, nog I hate that word. Gnosticism. There we go. Around the critical conceptions of identity and relevant power dynamics in practice, this typically means it is yet another justification within theory for only people who agree with theory to be considered knowledgeable authorities, which is then used to silence and install professionals in positions of authority and power based on group identity alone or almost alone, as such tend to have pre to present tend to have to present a critical consciousness, i.e. be woke. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here's the, here's the thing about it. Um, standpoint epistemology, the idea, the best way that I can summarize it is to say these particular people are the only ones who have knowledge of this. And this isn't common knowledge to everyone. But this is a critical thing of, critical component of critical race theory. This idea that only those people who are oppressed have knowledge of something, have knowledge of racism, have knowledge of this and societal structures, have knowledge of these truths. In other words, knowledge is not available to all. Do you see what I mean? The knowledge of something is not available to all in this particular um, framework with standpoint epistemology. That is the op one, an opposite to the idea of communality, that knowledge is available to everyone. Knowledge is made available to everyone. Um, in this case, it's not. It's only made. Of, it's only available knowledge to a select few, and the rest of you have to go along with it, according to this um, thing here with critical race theory and standpoint epistemology. And this comes in another form of, you know, you just got to believe the lived experiences of all these people. Uh, that's another thing that is just generally speaking, the um, the sort of secrecy behind it. There's only there's only one knowledge. There's only one way to know. Th these these are these are the people who know, and you just have to go along for the ride. No 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 no. Scientific scientific principles and norms of science do not say that. They say that the knowledge is belongs to everyone here, um, and should be shared with everyone. Not that the knowledge is unique and special, and that only these people can know it. <laughs> the knowledge belongs to everyone, not to. Uh, not just to one group of people. That's again, that's why critical race theory does not have communality as a norm to it, I don't think. And it is very much anti-communality. These are the only people who can know what racism is. The rest of you can't. So we have to tell, we have to, we have to, you have to go along with us. You have to believe everything we say um, because you can't possibly know what we do um, here. And I think actually... Of note in this one, one will notice that the identity-based knowledge in whiteness is a very thoroughly theorized concept, always problematically. Under the view of critical social justice, there is very much something understood to be white knowledge, or Western or Eurocentric. It is, in fact, described as an epistemology of ignorance, wherein white people, as a result of their privilege, are not invested are invested in not knowing so actively, willfully, perniciously, and semi-intentionally as for it to constitute its own kind of false knowledge. See white ignorance. Uh, moreover, whiteness itself would constitute or at least possess its own kind of knowledge system. See an episteme that characterizes white knowledge, which is often upheld as a reason why racial minorities and people outside the West shouldn't adopt science. Oh, that's another thing right there. We'll get to that in a minute. Shouldn't adopt da, 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 da which are deemed inherently white supremacist and colonist, it is difficult to discern how this blatant confusion about practical realities is meant to help anyone. Yeah, so this is the thing. It's a uh, knowledge that is unique only to one person. Only that group can know. Only this can group. Only that. Only that. Only that. Only that. No, 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 no. Science. Norms of science say knowledge is available to all. You may have to teach each other. That's true. But knowledge is available to all. 
Critical race theory doesn't say that. Critical race theory says that knowledge, there's unique knowledge to this group over here. There's knowledge to this group. This Only this group of people knows how awful this society is. Not so true, actually, in reality, but hey, um, that's my point there. Critical race theory is not for communality. And that makes it one point where it's quite anti-science. Anyway, <clears throat> next one on there um, is universalism. And this is the biggest one. Remember that universalism is about, um, is about the idea that you should not judge somebody's arguments, their work um, in science based upon their personal criteria, based upon race, sex, gender, and all the rest. Uh, and professional affiliation, too. You're not supposed to judge on any of that is what universalism says. You are supposed to treat all of that as equal. You are only supposed to judge their work based upon the merits of their arguments, the evidence, data, logic, reason, all that. <sighs> Critical race theory, we know, and it is the most obvious thing of them all, and what gets me so aggravated is it teaches exactly the opposite, that you should judge someone differently based upon the color of their skin and what race they are. Here's an example, whoops, not that one. Well, there's there's an example here that's, um, a few of you might know of the oppression matrix. This comes from the State University of New York, Old Westbury, um, here um, in their library, which I don't know what the hell they did here that they can't get this to work. But anyway, you might have seen an oppression matrix. This is a good example visually of these kinds of things. And that's what I have here, um, pulled it up from, from SUNY Old Westbury. Um, here, privileged, border, oppressed. You're supposed to treat these people differently because they're supposedly oppressed. You're supposed to treat these people differently because they're privileged. You, you're you supposed to treat people differently because of some some oppression out there. Treat them differently on the basis of their race. Often, they say, you're, oppre you're oppressed if you're black you, or Asian or native or Latina, Latino. Not Latinx, by the way. Latinx is 97% um, of Latino people actually don't like that word. Anyway, <clears throat> so you're oppressed if you're black. You're oppressed if you're Asian. Okay, you're, you're a privileged oppressor if you're white and you're somewhere in the middle if you're biracial. That's judging people based upon their skin. There's a word for that. You know, there is a word for that. And that's just quite quite a whole heck of a lot of nastiness right there. There is a word for that. And no, I'm not going to say it. But um, it's right here if you're wondering. It's kind of racist. Anyway, <clears throat> judging people like that. That's immediately against universalism. As scientists, you are not taught to say that these people are oppressed and they can't do something. And because of that, they can't do something. No, 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 no. You're judging them based upon their arguments. And it's a secret for me. Actually, when I do peer review, I don't even look at a person's name. I don't look up a photo. I don't look up anything. I don't look up a thing. The only thing I look at the author's names for when I do peer review is just to check real quick if I if I might have written a paper with that person somewhere in the last five years because then I can't review the paper. Um, and it's it's a conflict of interest for me to review the paper if, if um, I've published something else with them in the last five years. Um, here's another thing. And it, was, it particularly pertains to science. Um, James Lindsay had this here in New Discourses. Um, Critical race theory believes that science, reason, and evidence are a white way of knowing that storytelling and lived experience are a black alternative. Um, remember above, Delgado and Stefanik said that the normal science is a part of everyday ordinary racism of our societies. So that's because critical race theory is not particularly friendly to science, residing somewhere between generally disinterested in science and openly hostile to it, depending on circumstances. This is because critical race theory, using that social construction thesis, believes that the power and politics of cultural groups make their way intrinsically uh, into everything that culture produces. Thus, science is just politics by other means to critical race theory. Since modern science was predominantly produced by white Western men, critical race theory therefore views science as a white and Western way of knowing. Critical race theory therefore maintains that science encodes and perpetuates white dominance and thus isn't really fitting for black people who inhabit a cult political culture of blackness. This is obviously a historical, uh, horrible sentiment and one that goes against one of the very first pillars of science, universality or universalism, as I just said. Universality in science says that it doesn't matter who does an experiment, the result will always be the same. Again, if you're doing an experiment, that's the reproducibility part of it. If you're doing, if somebody, different races, sex, genders, rainbow farting, unicorn for all I care, if they're doing the experiment the same way, it doesn't matter, it should come out the same. Likewise, 
whomever is doing the experiment, you are judging them on the methods, the argument, the reason, the logic. You are never judging them on their race. And it is horrible that critical race theory presumes that a black person cannot do this. Let's see. This is because science believes in objectivity, which critical race theory also calls an oppressive myth. For example, Robin DiAngelo and Olsen Selensoy write, one of the key contributions of critical theorists concern the production of knowledge, given that the transmission of knowledge is an integral activity in schools. Critical scholars in the field of education, da, 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 an approach based upon calls into the question of whether or not objectivity is possible. Okay. Mm, do, 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 do. Let's see. Senso and D'Angelo also claim that science, quote, presumes the superiority and infallibility of the scientific method. We do not, actually. If she, if they knew a whole lot about the uh, literature around things surrounding the scientific method, there's actually a lot of debates about that going on right now and exactly how it should work. Anyway. And that, therefore, we should be asking whose rationality, whose presumed objectivity, objectivity underlies the scientific method. Then even more cynically, they ask... We, they, they insist that we must ask whose interests are served by science as though that's the relevant question to ask of a universalist method. Again, that's a presumption. You know, if you're thinking about different races here with this, they are presuming you judge somebody differently based upon the race here. Does And particularly with this, you are judging them differently based upon whose interests are served. You should judge the research based on whose interests are served. No, that's irrelevant to this. That is absolutely irrelevant. The only reason I would look at whether or not there's some kind of interest right there is whether there's a violation of the next part of it, the disinterestedness. No, 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 no. That is not the reason by which we judge research. Critical race theory falsely asserts that white people's interests are primarily served by science. It's not, this isn't all just wrong and it's genuinely racist. It's dangerous. Continuing the genuinely racist thinking that black people aren't suited to or served by science, Delgado and Stefan Stefanczyk say that storytelling is about their lived experience is a primary mode by which black people and critical race theory produce and advance knowledge. Importantly, these lived experiences are only considered valid if they agree with critical race theory. Critical race theorists have built on everyday experience with perspective, viewpoint, and the power of stories. Okay, that's not necessary here. While stories can be informative to create a position that science is a white way of knowing for Western people and storytelling is more suited to is one more suited to racial minorities, critical race theory is itself racist and cripples the people it claims to help. This happens in multiple ways, including by undermining the capacity for critical thinking, teaching them to see the world as an us versus them that oppresses them, and associating them with harmful negative stereotypes that rigorous methods are what white people and not black people use. Okay. This is why... This is why, and James laid it out beautifully here, I think. Thank you, thank you, James Lindsay and New Discourses. S critical race theory is very much not a universalist thing because it applies judgment based upon race. That's exactly the thing. And si that's exactly the opposite of what science is supposed to be. Science is, for one thing, common knowledge to everybody. So it's not knowledge specific to a particular group. It is not knowledge to that. It also says anybody can do science. So long as you got the logic, the arguments, methods, what have you, you can do it fact matter. I know many distinguished scientists of many minorities all over the world. They are amazing people. They're amazing at how well they can do their analytics. I learned from a lot of them when I was doing my PhD um, and my master's degree. Amazing people. They can, they're so amazing. I love working with them. Um, the universalism there is that anybody can do science. Anybody can do science. Anybody can do an so long as you have the logic, the argument, what have you, that's the only thing we're supposed to be judging you by. Not by whose interest is served. Not by what race you are. Not by the race of the person doing it. Not by the race of the people who'd be affected by it. Critical race theory teaches the opposite, that you should judge everything by that. That is the biggest reason. It is fundamentally anti-science. Critical race theory is fundamentally anti-science because it goes completely against the whole principle of universalism, which is an enlightenment principle, very much an enlightenment and classical liberal principle, should not, critical race theory should not have anything to do with science. And I'm going to keep saying it until I'm blue in the face, and I don't care if it falls on deaf ears. It's what I believe here. Critical race theory is anti-science, and this is the biggest reason why. And if you want another added bonus, just how anti-science critical race theory is, god damn it, Newsweek. Um, 
<laughs> some of you may remember this. This came from this flyer was part of the National Museum of African American History and Culture Aspects and Assumptions of Whiteness in White Culture. Here's something here. Emphasis on the scientific method, objective, rational, linear thinking, cause and effect relationships, quantitative emphasis. According to this infographic, all of this here, everything that science is, is an aspect of whiteness or an assumption of white culture um, or some combination thereof of the words at the top. This, this graphic was taken down. You won't find this on their website. That's why I found it with Newsweek. You won't find it on the museum website. And the reason it was taken down is precisely because of everything on here was assumed Everything on this infographic was assumed to be tagged as only white people do this. That's why it was so blatantly racist. Why do you think this graphic was taken down? Not because of anything that was offending, offending me, but because it's so damn racist to assume that somebody who is Asian, black, any of those things, don't have any of these values. And I know scientists who would genuinely be pissed if that assumption was made. That just because of somebody's race, they can't do science. That's another violation of universalism in principle. That's why critical race theory is anti-science. On to the next thing. <laughs> Sorry for getting hot under the collar there. Um, disinterestedness is the idea that you should be um, not having self-interest in here. Critical race theory inherently has self-interest that it tries to advance. Thanks to James Lindsay, also again, for providing this handy dandy scanned photo, photo here from Critical Race Theory and Introduction by G Richard Delgado and Gene Safonschik here. Um, and here is the thing here. The Critical Race Theory movement is a collection of activists and scholars, activists and scholars intent, interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up but places them in the broader perspective that includes economics, history, context, group, and self-interest, and even feelings and the unconscious. Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment, rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. Although CRT began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond the discipline. Today, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT ideas, CRT's ideas, to understand issues of schools, discipline, and hierarchy, tracking, controver tracking controversies over curriculum and history, and IQ and achievement testing. Political scientists ponder voting strategies coined by critical race theorists. Ethnic studies courses often include a unit on critical race theory, and Af American studies departments teach material on critical white studies developed by CRT writers. Unlike some academic disciplines, the critical, ra critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It not only tries to understand our social situation, but to change it. And it sets out not only to ascertain how society organizes itself along racial lines and hierarchies, but to transform it for the better. In other words, critical race theorists are not self-interested, are not disinterested. They are very interested. They have their own self-interests that they're after. They are quite the opposite of scientists. They are not fully interested in the truth as much as they are interested in changing things. That is not science. That is absolutely not science. That is anti-science. Thank you again, James Lindsay, for providing this handy little number here. And moving along, because I know I'm running long today, here a little bit. Um, oh, actually. Oh, I can add to this, actually, now that I think about it, because of... This is one of the reasons why I'm doing this video. So, one of the reasons I'm doing this video is actually because of stuff that I saw pop in to the American Geophysical Union, which for the record is one of the largest professional societies of um, scientists and science and enthusiasts for that matter in the world. This is what came up here. This is Unlearning Racism in the Geosciences. Aha, uh -huh. yep, yep. Kimberly Crenshaw, I thought so. I thought so. That was one of the people who was cited in this, and she is a critical race theorist. She actually coined the phrase critical race theory. Um, she also coined intersectionality, and that's the reason that I end up doing this video, because obviously AGU has forgotten the norms of science um, quite well. When they endorse this, put it forward and ask for people to go do it um, here. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this, is they are bringing activism into the sciences by this. Good job, AGU. Um, along with completely ignoring universalism. Great. Great. Okay, um, here. <clears throat> the final thing that's important in all this 
is the uh, principle of organized skepticism. Um, and again, this is about disagreement, but disagreement that is, you, you're not attacking the individual, you're attacking the arguments, is what it's supposed to be when you're doing science. Okay, here's the reason that critical race theorists um, don't, don't work with the principle of organized skepticism um, here, because they don't care and because if you disagree, no, 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 it, the, you're doing it for white supremacist and racist reasons. They give you no benefit of the doubt. They don't attack your argument. They attack you. They say you're doing your disagreement because you're a racist or what have you, or any number of different things here that you, you can't do. You can't do that. No, 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 no. Robin D'Angelo says it and prevent them from coming. Yeah. Um, here, da, 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 where is it? <clears throat> Before we discuss the case of how impossible disagreement is for white people, consider a few poignant examples. The black superstar musician Kanye West famously donned a Make America Great Again hat and said he thinks for himself. In response, the poet laureate of critical race theory, Ta-Nehisi Coates, wrote a widely read article suggesting that West is no longer really black. The black musician Daryl Davis, who is most famous for taking hundreds of white supremacists out of the Ku Klux Klan hoods, once tried to invite a conversation of this sort in 2019, and members of the nominally anti-fascist group called Antifa called him white supremacist for being willing to associate with, rather than fight or kill, the people he invited to have a conversation. The phenomena, phenomena can be explained, as Nicole Hannah-Jones, creator of the New York Times Magazine 1619 Project, uh, not an article of history, tweeted, and then deleted, there is a racially black on the one hand and there's a politically black on the other. Critical race theory is only interested in identity politics associated with being politically black and anyone who disagrees with critically race, critical race theory, even if not racially, even if racially black does not qualify. The common way to phrase this is that they're that they are not really black. This means that critical race theory, in critical race theory, diversity, which it calls for often, must only be skin deep. Everyone's politics must agree and must agree with critical race theory. In other words, you cannot disagree under critical race theory. You cannot have arguments about, you can't have knowledge-based arguments about anything. You cannot question logic, you cannot question the argument, any number of different things here. And I've got a few more courtesy of, courtesy of cynical theories, actually here. <clears throat> Uh, yes. So, a couple of these quotes are not actually from cynical theories themselves, but they happen to be handily in the book. That's why I wanted to pull it up. Um, easier to find than online if I can just pull it out of the book. Uh, Barbara Applebaum and Being White Being Good writes in a few different places. Um, here. One can disagree. Here it is. From Being White Being Good, um, as rewritten in cynical theories. One can disagree and remain engaged in the material, for example, by asking questions and searching for clarification and understanding. Denials, however, function as a way to distance oneself from the material and dismiss without engagement. Applebaum's whole thing in here is that, um, and she is a critical race theorist, being right, being white, being good is the book there. But um, she says, no, 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 you can, you can ask questions of the thesis and try to understand it, but you're not allowed to disagree with her argument. End of sentence there. Um, you can't disagree with the argument at all. Let's see. Students in her courses that make systemic injustice, quote, students in her courses, in courses that make systemic injustice explicit, often complain in teacher evaluations that they have not been allowed to disagree in the course. Students often maintain that such courses indoctrinate in a particular view about racism that they are not willing to accept. Applebaum it does advocate shutting down all disagreement. And that's true of a lot of critical race theorists. They will never, never allow disagreement. Scientists allow disagreement in that we have the idea of going back and forth and scrutinizing each other's beliefs, our arguments on the subject, very carefully using logic and evidence and data and reason. Applebaum doesn't allow any of that at all. No critical race theorists allow that at all. They don't have organized skepticism. They have basically shut you down. You, If you, dis you disagree with me, you're a bigot. That's pretty much what it amounts to with critical race theory. And that's why that's part of it is anti-science too. Let me see if there's another, let's see, yeah. Um, so in this section, she's actually writing about a student um, who questioned her on the gender wage gap. Allowing him to express his disagreement and spending time trying to challenge his beliefs often comes at a cost uh, to marginalized students whose experience are, even if indirectly, dismissed by his claims. That goes back to the problem that they have with not having communality. Let's see, um... 
So another another good example here, again, from cynical theories, um, but drawing, they're quoting here from uh, tracking privilege preserving epistemic pushback in feminist and critical race philosophy classes. This is Alison Bailey, 2017. Um, there is a lot of here that, you know, criticisms, criticisms are assumed to be attempts to ignore in critical race theory. And again, this is a great book, Cynical Theories, if you want to break it down and start thinking about it in terms of how critical race theory and a lot of the critical theories actually are all completely anti-science. Um, here, <clears throat> let's see. Criticism of social justice work is immoral and harmful, according to Bailey. So, quote, I focus on these ground-holding responses because they are pervasive, tenacious, and bear strong resemblance to critical thinking practices, and because I believe that their in in uninterrupted circulation does psychological and un epistemic harm of marginalized groups. Um, scholars like Bailey assume that the disagreement with their work must be the result of intellectual and moral failings. No such disagreement can ever be brooked. Treating privilege-preserving epistemic pushback as a form of critical engagement validates it and allows it to circulate more freely. This, as I'll argue later, can do epistemic violence to oppressed groups. It should therefore be shut down and replaced with social justice scholarship, according to Bailey. Critical thinking itself is a problem and needs to be replaced with critical pedagogy, where critical means something completely different. Quote, the critical thinking tradition is concerned primarily with epistemic adequacy. To be critical is to show good judgment in recognizing when arguments are faulty, assertions lack evidence, truth claims appeal to unreliable sources, or concepts are sloppily, craft, sloppily crafted and applied. So what that first part of that quote that Bailey has here, that's what you're supposed to do with organized skepticism too, alongside of critical thinking. You are supposed to be looking at arguments being faulty, assertions lacking evidence, and all that. You're supposed to be doing that. That's a good part of science. Critical pedagogy regards the claims that students make in response to social justice issues not as propositions to be assessed for their truth value, but as expressions of power that function to reinscribe and perpetuate social inequalities. Its mission is to teach students ways of identifying and mapping how power shapes our understanding of the world. This is the first step towards resisting and transforming social injustices. The aim is not the truth. That goes back to the disinterestedness thing right here. The aim here is not the truth. The aim is to stifle disagreement, which has to do with, um, again, here. And the ultimate one, of course, if you really want to know, is uh, the ultimate one for being against the organized skepticism principle is actually Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility, which she basically says, if you disagree with me, that's proof that you're a racist. It's a very emotionally manipulative tactic. She cannot assume that there is any logical-based reason, any thought logical evidence-based reason that you might disagree with her. No, you're just immoral. You're just a racist. You're an ignorant racist who's afraid to admit that you're a racist, according to Robin DiAngelo. But that goes, all of those kinds of things where you just shut down disagreement because somebody's, you, you presume they're immoral and just shut them down and don't listen and don't carefully and detachedly scrutinize people's beliefs and arguments. That goes against the pr principle of organized skepticism. Um, that goes with science. And again, that's another reason why critical race theory is anti-science. So, this video has run long. So, to recap here, and hopefully I get it all right. <clears throat> communality in science. The idea that knowledge should be accessible to all. Critical race theory says, no, the knowledge of racism in the world is only accessible to those who've been historically oppressed. It's not accessible to all. Um, and specifically, it's only accessible to those people who think with a critical consciousness worldview. It cannot be accessible to anybody who does not, and therefore you should just listen to them. So, critical race theory does not operate with communality. Universalism, the biggest one. Critical race theory teaches that you should treat people differently based upon their race, that you should consider their arguments, especially based upon their race, sex, gender, all that jazz. Science does not teach that. Science teaches universalism which is the practice that your race, your sex, your gender does not matter. You can do science. So long as you construct your arguments well um, here, and that's what we're going to judge you on, you can do science. We don't care. We don't care about the race and all that kind of jazz. Critical race theory teaches the opposite. Disinterestedness. Critical race theory has an active activist component to it. It is very much trying to change the world. The scientists in our disinterestedness, all we're supposed to chase after is the truth. And finally, the organized skepticism, you're supposed to be going after a person's arguments if you're a scientist. 
You are supposed to allow debate and disagreement. You can't do that under critical race theory. Critical race theory does not allow for debate and disagreement. You can't be a skeptic. If you're a skeptic, you're a bigot, according to critical race theory. Those are the four reasons, four norms right there, and how critical race theory is completely anti, anti all of them here. And why, for the record, critical race theory is anti-science. And for the final thing there, American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, all the professional science societies and universities, if you're watching this, I doubt you are, but in case you are, do us a favor. Don't bring something that is actively anti-science into a professional science society. Why in the goddamn world would you want to teach our early careers and our profession and our students of science? Why would you want to teach them to judge somebody's arguments differently based upon their race? Why in the hell would you want to teach them that only some people have knowledge and others can't have this knowledge? Why would you want to teach them that the truth doesn't matter? Why would you want to teach someone not to, in science to not tolerate disagreement? That's what critical race theory does. Why in your goddamn name? Why, why in the world would you... Why in the god... Why in the god... Why in the freaking world would you want... I'm so angry I can't get this out. Why in the freaking world... Would you want to bring critical race theory, critical theory, into science when it teaches exactly the opposite of everything that science is? I am so glad I am not a member of any of those institutions. Because you all don't represent me. You all don't represent scientists. You all don't represent science. Period. You stopped doing that the minute you started bringing this crap into professional science societies and universities stopped being stopped being great about it when they started bringing this crap into into scientific disciplines too start thinking about it and stop doing it and actually teach the norms teach those four norms of science and why they matter why, why it is the bedrock of things that we do all right i think that's it for me <laughs> Um, here, this is a long enough video. Um, anyway, if you like this video, please subscribe to the channel. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and please let me know your thoughts. I'd be curious if you were thinking about it. I know this is a little bit long, um, because there was a lot to dig into, um, here. Um, you can also head over and become a supporter, cyworthy.locals.com, if you would like to, uh, get in touch with me more. Uh, please leave some comments and let me know what you think. I appreciate it. Uh, until next time, I'm Adrian, your sometimes angry climate scientist. <laughs> <laughs> An angry, annoyed climate scientist um, signing off. Stay curious, my friends.